in areas like these, um, going back to the past, we have to do a story with the festival of the and to the talk with more so, the way that this is going to be is that it's a Um, the, the studio is was actually um, part of the Tisch School at NYU, which is why we're doing it here at NYU. And um, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, the time period we're talking about for me that led up to coming here, I, I'll just have to briefly give a background um, in it. Uh, I, I ended up after I was young. I, I ended up after after high school. Um, playing in the Denver Symphony, where I met Stan Brackett and Jim Tenney, who also just got out of high school. Um, and because it was the uh, Korean War, and I, I, I was eventually, after two years, I was drafted and um, ended up at the end of the Korean War, stationed in, at the Presidio, the Army put me there. And that's in San Francisco, and that's how I got to San Francisco. And, um, and and ended up staying there. This, this would have been mid-50s. And um, I was playing the clarinet um, part-time at the San Francisco Symphony, and I mean, after I got out of the Army, and, um, and, and doing a lot of work with the clarinet. I was fairly well-known as a kid, um, as a young person, as a clarinetist. I was writing my first public music, um, um, in that period, in the early, early and mid uh, '50s, and uh, one of the things that I did was in San Francisco around 1958 was to um, uh, I I was offered um, a commission to write music for a, a new production um, by Herb Blau, who was running the Actors Workshop in San Francisco, a production of King Lear, and. I decided they offered me three hundred dollars, which was really a huge amount of money at that point for me. And I was able to buy a tape recorder. It turned out now when I go back in it, it was just the second year that tape recorders were available for um, for for people in their homes. But I bought a tape recorder and decided I was going to make music concrete score for King Lear. And the production, it was took almost two years for the, uh, before the actual production happened. So it was close to 1960 um, by the time that production happened. But it was a big success. It, had, it was written up all over the place. And um, it eventually led um, the actors' work. And I, then I wrote music for it. I was the music director of that theater. Uh, and then, then um, when the Vivian Beaumont, 
at Lincoln Center opened, they brought the, the company out that was 1965. Um, to start the Vivian Bowman and Lincoln Center. So I was invited out for that. That was uh, by Herb Lau. And then uh, I was also working as the composer for the Ann Halpern Dance Company. And um, the Tisch School was just starting right around at that, that, that time. And I had very little relationship to, uh, to the academic world. Um, in fact, when I graduated from Mills College, I, I mean, I got a degree there. Uh, they offered me a full-time position, and I said, I don't want a full-time position. I don't want to teach. And But I needed, they offered me $4,400 um, for full-time. And um, and I said, actually, I could use $2,000, so I'll do half-time. So I, that's what I did at, at the beginning. And, and um, so when, um, when they brought, right around that time, that same period of time, the Tisch School was opening uh, at, at NYU, the School of the Arts, and Robert Corrigan, uh, who had come from the Tulane Drama Review, was a close friend of Herb's. Herb said, we're coming to New York, and Bob said, well, maybe I can get more to be, um, well, he just didn't say more because he didn't know me, but Morton Sabotnik to be... Um, uh, an artist in residence because they had just hired Len Lai to be one artist and what they were after and the reason I'm giving this what they were after is two artists who were um, multidisciplinary to be sort of not not teachers at the school but sort of the people who were out in the world and for the students to come and see and, and, and hear about so um, that's how I, that's how I got yeah, it was actually uh, 1960. I did a, my first big piece, which used um, light and image and musicians, and uh, that was 1961. And then we started Ramona and I started the Tape Music Center, and I began to work on the idea of of a composer being a studio artist, and I was trying to get a machine that would allow me to do that and, uh, and put an ad in the paper and got Donald Bruclo. By 1963 at the Tape Center, uh, Tony was involved actually earlier and then we did um, a, a pretty a full length evening um, in 1963 using uh, overhead projection and, and things like that. So by the time I came here, that's, that's what I was really known for. I was known for interdisciplinary uh, work with dance and, and visuals and, and various kinds of things. Where you see the sign, the Laker Street Cinema, that's that's now a um, stationary store. And and the studio there there is um, there's the the, uh, the very high tech um, buzzer to get in. Tony's Tony's on the top um, and I'm you can see the very you can see that. And these are all artists. Um, they were all painters, except me. Um, and we actually had a, a um, there was a buzzer system, and we had a, uh, the, the front door, what, what was the address, Tony? Two, two well, it doesn't matter. But, but, um, but we had a camera up above, the, the, the door didn't lock to Bleecker Street, so we had a, camera up there and a sign that said you were being watched or something like that. But there was actually only the housing for a camera. There was no actual camera in it. And um, that was right up those stairs there. Well, so so that's that's the book club. Uh, the, the thing is that I really didn't want to be at a university. And, um, and so Bob Corrigan, I, I gave him a terrible time. I don't know. I, I was so young, I don't know why I was giving him a terrible time, but I gave him a terrible time. And I kept making, <laughs> it's a little bit like what we're going through with humor and, uh, and, and the whole thing. I gave him all kinds of conditions that were impossible. And uh, he finally, he finally, um, and I was, I was commuting from San Francisco to Vivian Beaumont, hadn't moved in yet. So one of the trips, he said, um, 
I, I told him I didn't want to be on a campus. I didn't know NYU didn't have a campus, so um, uh, so I, I imagine I, you know Ivy growing on buildings and things. And uh, he said, I said I can't, I cannot work in a, a university setting. He said, okay, well we'll get you a studio, not on the set on the thing that was the Bleecker Street studio. And I kept making demands. Finally, one night when I was in town, he took me to Knickerbocker. He, uh, he met me at Knickerbocker's and brought the Erdogan brothers, who were Atlantic Records, and Tommy Dodd, who was their main engineer, who had made these million dollar rec- a million sales records by changing the speed to get the right tempo that everybody would like. And I was, I mean, it, he, so he knew I didn't want to be part of a, an institution, and this was certainly not, you know, academic. So the evening went really well, and finally I realized we were there to sign a contract. I said, where's my contract? And he said, I've got it here. And he opens, gets an envelope, pulls out this paper, hands it to me with a pencil or a pen, and it has uh, NYU letterhead, and down below it has a signature and there's nothing on the page. So I said, where's the contract? He said, you, you take this pen, write on here whatever you want, <laughs> which I did, and uh, except you couldn't change the money, but I could do everything else. So I ended up with the studio on Bleecker Street. I had no idea what Bleecker Street was or anything. It was really amazing. And that was the, the book law. Oh, and then he had to buy a book law as well, the, the, the duplicate of the one we had uh, in, at Mills Co- at, 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 in San Francisco. Uh, it actually has more in it, uh, because by then I actually knew more about what we were doing and what I was going to do with it, so it's a little bigger. And above above it, you see, there's a, um, it's, it's a sequencer, um, which is a silicon rectifier sequencer, which ran uh, light bulbs and and um, and strobe lights, so I could tie it in and have have full control of um, lights in different places and and, and and things like that. Yeah, well, um, it was it still only was a very quick time and. Um, within a few months of being there, people started to come into the studio. Um, the um, um, people from rock bands would come at two o'clock. I was working through the night. We'd come in at two o'clock and sit on a sofa I had in there, um, and just people just wander in. And um, the this is a um, Bose speaker, the beginning, this was the beginning of the Bose speaker company, and um, they went to Columbia, the Columbia studio, um, and they came to my studio, and they said, we're offering you, we give you these speakers um, free, um, so that we can, you know, talk about them, and they had a lifetime guarantee that you could not, you could not blow them. Well, I had people coming. I had people coming into the studio. I mean, this was the beginning of the like. Of, it, there was no analog synthesizers. This was it. And so, um, and the same thing at, at, at Columbia University. They, uh, they, it wasn't an analog synthesizer, but they had you know uh, sine tones and things, sine waves. So that people would come in and and dial the the the, the, the sine tone up to you know two thousand. Um, 20,000 cycles that they couldn't hear, and so they would raise the volume and, and, until they could hear it, but they would also smell it because because these speakers would burn, so they were burning in every studio there that <laughs> they put their both speakers in. They got rid of the, the lifetime warranty, and um, but they still had the speakers, so that was the Bose. I had four of them. You know, Lent, well, let me just say, what you're seeing is he was a kinetic sculptor and an experimental film uh, maker, and um, and he, later when Tony took Tony took over his studio later, but um, but this was just the very beginning.
Feb 5. What preceded was Twister slung up and let fall and Blade hit by a cork ball, ending up with a little bit of Blade being touched by the Twister. Okay? <laughs> That was, um, um, I, I'd forgotten about that, but um, the people archiving his stuff sent it to me. Um, it, it, we did a duet with kinetic sculpture and, um, and electronic sound. It was kind of a, um, a little marching piece. <laughs> that, what, what do you, I remember, what he's doing is he's saying he's going to do 4-4 four, four with this, but he's going to do something else with that, and, and then we, one, two, three, four, play. <laughs> so that, that was it. I, I met him because they had brought him, brought Len and I to Bleecker Street. When I de demanded a studio, they found a place that had two studios, and they put Len Lai in the back in a big studio and me in the front, and that's when I met him. I had known him before then. <laughs> <laughs> 